Department of Transportation is calling the zipper merge. Are you familiar with that? How many, how many of you don't know what the zipper merge is? A few of you? It was new for me, I got to be honest with you. The zipper merge is a recommendation from the Department of Transportation that says, we want, we, if, if, if you're experiencing uh, traffic stoppage, if things are slowing down, they're stalled out, that, that all lanes go as far as they possibly can until they have to then merge together like a zipper. Now, it's, it was a new concept to me, and I, I had a friend of mine who said, no, we, we heard about that in Germany. They served in the military. In Germany, is, is in 2003, so maybe this is a concept that's been around for a long time. I had never heard of it before. It was a brand new concept for me. I thought to myself, well, did they do, did they do new research? Did they, did they you know, do a study? Did they find out some data maybe that we didn't know? Maybe it's just the proliferation of social media, so it's bouncing all around. I didn't know, but I had never heard of it before, and... Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this, I'm reflecting on this, and I'm from California, and uh, the last few years we were there, we grew up in a large, we, 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 uh, we lived in a large metro area in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there's always a lot of traffic stoppage there, and I can pretty much guarantee you that if you're in the lane that's backed up maybe for a mile or more, and some chump tries to go around you <laughs> and then merge in later... I'm pretty sure he's going to get yanked out of his car and stabbed. And I might be the guy to do it. And I would feel justified in doing that. Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm a good citizen. I'm doing my part. I'm driving in the lane. I'm taking my turn. And this guy's just bombing up and he's going to cut in front of me. I don't think so. Well, not going to happen. So, so this was a new thing. And I was, I, I, I was deeply convinced that my convictions were right, that my anger was justified. And if I, if I showed that anger, if I demonstrated that anger with some, you know, verbal outrage or, you know, finger outrage or something, um, I was justified in that. The problem is I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. There was, a, there was this new data that came out that indicated I was wrong. So a deeply held principle of mine, something I felt very convicted in, something I felt right and justified in, turned out to be wrong after all. It got me thinking, what are those other zipper merge issues that we have? And I don't mean like getting up in front of people with your pants unzipped. When I was a little guy, uh, I began to work, serve in the church, and, and you take the... You, you take the uh, like for a little guy, the first day they get to pass the offering plate around, that was a big deal. And my dad, who was a pastor, he would always say, now remember, Jim, whenever everybody's sort of bowed, bowing their head and praying, you always reach down and make sure your zipper is, is zipped up. So I'm not talking about zipper merge issues like that. I'm talking about what are those blind spots that we have? What are those things that we feel we're so right in and, we're, and they're deeply held convictions that might go back to our culture of origin, our whatever it is, our traditions, things that we feel very justified in, but frankly, we're wrong in. What are those things? And I, was, and I began thinking, God, do I have some of those blind spots? Do I have some of those zipper merge? I, here's the thing. We're going to look at a story today of, a, of, of the great apostle Peter. He had them. He had this huge blind spot. We're going to look at today. James had him, the, the leader of the church of Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus. He had a huge blind spot. Barnabas, the partner of, of Paul, the great missionary, he had these blind spots. And I'm thinking to myself, man, if these great men of faith, if these heroes of our faith had these blind spots, I'm sure I've got them too. We're going to talk about that today. What do we do? How do we, how do we, how do we learn about our blind spots? And how does it, how does it, how does it operate in the kingdom of heaven? How does Jesus, how does God see it? Let's take a look at that today. See if we can learn some things about who we are as a people, who we are as a culture, what God is doing with this thing called the church and the kingdom. Lord, I'm, I'm just grateful. My heart is full. It's always uh, such a privilege to dedicate young families to, to you and to uh, dedicate uh, these, these precious little babies. Um, it's very powerful, Lord, and we're grateful to be able to do it and, and uh, to sing your praises, to be... Um, Restore renewed friendship when you see the healing of, of our friend Ken and uh, just all these things, Lord, make my heart happy and full and, and just, again, recognizing that you are the God that saves, you're the God that heals, you're the God that delivers, the God that sets us free. Help us to learn more about who you are so that we can fulfill every purpose that you have for us in your life, in our lives. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's remind ourselves a little bit about who Peter was. Um, Peter was the 
one of the, the original 12 disciples that traveled with Jesus, lived with Jesus. He was the oldest of the disciples, so he was, a, he was sort of the leader of the disciples. And in fact, throughout the first part of the book of Acts, he was really a sort of, the, the narrative is, is centered largely around Peter. Jesus called him the rock upon which he was going to build the church. It was Peter that preached that uh, at, at the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people were saved. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a, a tremendous man of influence and, and a powerful man of the spirit. Um, he, uh, he was, as, as the church was growing, he's traveling uh, to, a, to a town called Joppa. He's going, it's a little bit north and west of Jerusalem. He's going to Joppa to uh, kind of just follow up with some of these great churches that were springing up. They'd be part of the Jewish culture. These, these, been, these would have been Jews who are, who are identifying now with the Christian faith, but Christianity was sort of seen as an, extensive, an extension of Judaism in the early church. So he's seeing these churches. He's, he's encouraging them. Along the way, he, he raises a little girl from the dead, really just powerful things that, that uh, Peter is doing. And um, along this trip, he's resting at some friend's house, and he's staying, he's staying in their home, and he's fasting, he's praying, he's on the rooftop, and he's hungry. And while he's having this, uh, this, this prayer time, he sees a vision of a, of a sheet descending from heaven, and on the sheet, there's all kinds of animals which would be considered unclean in his culture, and, and, um, and there's a voice from heaven that says, rise, kill, and eat. It's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And... Uh, um, and so he says, no, Lord, I, I could never, uh, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And uh, God says the things, beca because he was a Jew, so Jews had very strict diets as many of them still practice today. And the idea of the dietary laws was to keep them separate from the, from the nations that surrounded them. So he said, no, no unclean is ever, un nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And God says, the things that, uh, don't call the things unclean that I have declared to be clean. So Peter's reflecting on that. He's thinking about this. And while he's thinking on it, there's this knock comes on the door. And there's, uh, there's these three guys. Two of them are, are Roman soldiers. And there's another one who's an official in, uh, in, in an official capacity. And they say, hey, we'd like for you to come with us in Joppa. Here's what, or, or to Caesarea. Here's what uh, Peter didn't know is that in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who had been praying, and in, uh, an angel of the Lord visited him and said, send men to Joppa to bring Peter back up to Caesarea. And uh, so Peter now is beginning to kind of think through, oh, okay, maybe I'm understanding what God is saying. You can imagine a, a Jew being, you know, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and there's two Roman soldiers and an, an official there saying, hey, you want to come, you know, come to Caesarea with us. So he's beginning to understand a little bit of what, uh, of what now the dream is meaning. So he goes, up, he goes to Caesarea and in this house, Cornelius' house, he preaches the gospel and dozens and dozens and dozens of people get saved and they get baptized and they begin speaking in tongues. It's this amazing outpouring of God's power and, and uh, God's presence on, that, on, that, on Cornelius' home. Now what happens, as it does in so many situations, when the power of God is manifest, uh, people begin to go, well, why were you there in the first place? There's always, you ever notice that? Whenever there's a big outpouring of God's spirit, there's always people go, mm, yeah, I don't know about that. And this is what's happening with, the, with some of the leaders in Jerusalem. So they bring Peter in to ask him, why were you spending time with these Gentiles? A good, devout Jew would never go into the home of a Gentile. So they're asking him, why did you spend time in a Gentile? Gentile, by the way, is anybody who's not Jewish. And uh, so Peter says, I was led there divinely. He tells them the whole story. He says, I preached the gospel to them. They were saved. They were baptized. They, were, they, were, uh, they spoke in tongues. He says, I, how, could I, how could I keep them from entering into the family of grace? How could I do that? And um, just told the story, a powerful, powerful story. And he, and he pleaded that the gospel needs to go to the Gentiles. And so the, the leaders of the Jerusalem church says, yes, the gospel should go to the Gentiles. So Peter was formative in the gospel being released to, uh, to those outside of the Jewish faith. Very remarkable. Now, even in spite of that, though, Peter had this huge blind spot, and Paul would write about it um, in the book of Galatians. Paul and Peter would have been about the same age, Peter, but Paul came into the story a little bit later because he got saved later in his life. He didn't, spend, he didn't live with Jesus. He didn't know Jesus when Jesus was alive. He got saved later in his life. So Paul is writing about, um, writing about this, little, this blind spot that, that Peter has. We read about it in Galatians 2. And in verse number 11, I want to read it so we can really understand 
the context and how, and how Paul is responding uh, to Peter. When Cephas, that would be uh, Peter's given name, when Cephas came to Antioch, that is Peter, I opposed him to his face. This is Paul writing here. Because he stood condemned. For, for before certain men came from James, what, what he's saying is people came from the church of Jerusalem. Whether they came, whether this was really, uh, I believe it was a blind spot in James's thinking, but some, but some believe that maybe they're, they're being manipulative and they're, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're saying James sent us, but James didn't really send us. But I, I think this is a blind spot for James as well. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, that is Peter, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Um, so what's happening is Peter, Peter is, is associating in, in Antioch with all of these Gentile believers. But as people from the church, the Judaizers, this was a big problem in the first uh, few decades of the church, is that, is that uh, because it came out of a, the Jewish community, people of the Jewish faith who got saved, they believed in Jesus, they believed that Jesus was Messiah, but they would still insist that the Gentiles had to go through the rituals of circumcision, the dietary laws, and all these things. So they, 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 they kind of kept adding to what Paul is talking about, the law and grace. He's, he's talking about the Mosaic law. So this was a huge problem in the first, the first few uh, years of the church. And so Peter is here, he's hanging out with all these Gentiles, but these men come from Jerusalem saying, why are you hanging out with them? And then because Peter is losing influence, he's losing, uh, uh, he's, he's fearful of these Judaizers, of these men, these, this group of the circumcision, he then begins to step back from these Gentile Christians that the Jewish law said you're not supposed to hang out with, but the Jesus law said you're supposed to hang out with them. So there's this sort of conflict uh, that's going on amongst Peter and some of the others. And it was so severe that it caused Barnabas, who was a great missionary with Paul, to be led astray as well and other Christians throughout the area. So, so, the, so, so this was a, a deeply influential divide that was happening in this uh, early church. This is Paul continuing to speak here. But when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that is Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? He says, look, you're a Jew, but you're living like a Gentile until other Jews come around, and then you start backing up from them and start acting like a Jew again. And how can you then be the guy that can say, hey, you guys need to go through all of these external rit rituals, this, these rituals of religiosity? In fact, it was Peter that at one point told the, the leaders in Jerusalem, he said, we can't, we can't place on people a burden that we ourselves were not able to endure. So he was, the, he was the voice, the main voice of saying the gospel has got to go to the Gentiles without any inhibition, but now he's sort of putting back all of these, these rituals and all of these, all of these chains back onto people. He says, this doesn't even make sense. Basically, you're being a hypocrite. You act like a good Jew when there's no, or you act like a Gentile when there's no Jews around, but as soon as the Jews come back into town, you start acting like a Jew again. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, sinful Gentiles is sort of like a quotation. In fact, in some of your earlier versions of the NIV, it actually is in quotations. It's kind of comical. So he's saying like, yeah, these sinful Gentiles, because in Paul's theology, all of us were sinners. The, 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 the Jews were no better than the Gentiles at all. So it says, we who are Jews and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. All right, we need to be sp specific about what he's talking about. Sometimes when people read verses like these, and there were a lot of them with Paul, they think he's talking about sort of overall religious behavior, the rules that are supposed to apply to Christianity. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about specifically the law of Moses. So there's never a conflict between law and grace. The grace is, law is gracious and the grace is, law, the grace is lawful. There's never a conflict in it. And, but sometimes people use excuses like these when you sort of call them out on behavior that maybe doesn't reflect you know, their love for Christ. And they go, well, you're being, you know, you're, you're adhering to the law and not grace. And it's not, Paul never made that dichotomy. What he did talk about is the distinction between the dispensation of grace that comes through Jesus Christ and the, the, uh, the Jewish law, the Mosaic law. So he's talking about something very specific here. He says, we are Jews by birth, not sinful Gentiles. Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law... Uh, 
because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. The idea of justification is a legal term that says I'm, I'm guilty from sin, but through Jesus Christ, I'm justified. I've, I've been made clean. I've been declared completely righteous. One, one way, easy way of remembering it is, is to say it's just as if I'd never done it. So in other words, your sins are blotted out. They're completely cleansed. And what he's saying is that it doesn't happen through the law or through external religiosity might be a better way for us to understand it. He says these external religious practices, they're not the things that justify you. What justifies you is, is your faith and your belief and your trust in Jesus Christ being made a new creation. That is as true today as it ever was. So in other words, the things, it's not my external religiosity. It's not the fact that I come to church every week, although that's important. It's not the fact that I read my Bible every day, although that's important. It's not that I pray. All these external things things can be very, very good things, but in the end, it's do I, am, have I been made a new creation in Christ? Have I, have, have I, do I recognize him as my Lord? Do I believe in the claims of scripture? Those are the things that, that determine my faith, my, my new life. And so he's saying, look, it's not these external things that do it. It's, it's faith in Jesus Christ. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promoted sin? So in other words, he's saying, so, so kind of follow the logic. He's saying, look, if these Judaizers, if these men that came from James are correct. Now, they were Christians. Remember that. They were Christians, but they were, they were piling on the gospel a whole lot of external religious things. So what he's saying, he says, okay, if these, if these guys are right, then, then Jesus, who said I'm supposed to be amongst Gentiles, Jesus who came and set the, set the people free and, and commissioned that the gospel be, pr be preached to the whole world. So in, other words, in, in order for the gospel to be preached to the whole world, you have to be among people that don't know him, right? You have to be amongst these Gentiles. So he says, if, if, if this is right, then, they're putting, then, we're, then the Judaizers are putting these external religious things on it, making it a sin to be in the world. Who's right? They can't both be right. In other words, the words of Jesus to go and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth can't be right, and the words of the Judaizers who say don't be amongst people who are not of the world, who are of the world, who are Gentiles, both people can't be right. So in other words, if I'm a follower of Jesus, then I guess Jesus is making me sin, right? And then he goes, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. If I rebuild what I destroy, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Now, remember, he's still talking to Peter. This whole quotation is to Peter. He's saying, this is what I said to Peter. So when he says, I, he's also saying, and by the way, you too, because Peter acknowledged that, that Paul was an apostle. So as an apostle, Paul recognized that this whole system of religiosity had to be broken down so that people would understand the claims of grace. So he said, if I broke this all down... By God's direction, by the way, as you did too, Peter, and then I build it all back up again, I'm the one that's sinning. If we can understand it from our metaphor, it'd be as if Peter was the guy running around with the sign saying, everybody zipper merge, everybody zipper merge. He's putting it on his Facebook post. He's tweeting it. He's calling his friends and neighbors, make sure you zipper merge, everybody zipper merge. And then he's the crabby old guy in the back of the line that ain't moving, and he's scowling at everybody that's zipper merging. It doesn't make any sense, does it? He says, if, you, if you're the one that sort of tore this down, but now you're building it back up, it's not the people that listen to you that are sinning. You're the one that's sinning. Now, remember that for us in the church. If we, talk, if we, if we speak a gospel of grace... If we talk about grace, if we talk about love, if we talk about reconciliation, forgiveness, if we talk about these things, but then we pile up a lot of external religiosity, it's not the people that don't adhere to that that is sinning, it's us. Because we're preaching an inconsistent gospel. And this is what he's saying to Peter. He says, dude, you're the one that along with me broke this all down, and now you're trying to build it all back up. God tore it down for a reason. Don't build it back up again. He says, for, the, for through the law I died, again, that's the law of Moses, through the law I died to the law, um, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The, the law has passed. The, the Mosaic law has been fulfilled. I died with Jesus so that he could then raise me up in new life. I live now through him. Now, this has huge implications for us today. Peter's, Peter's concern, Peter's worry was that, was that the Jewish people were losing market share. 
Now the influence of the, with this new thing called Christianity, the gospel was going out to all of the Gentiles. And they were fearful because they were already were a marginalized people. They were losing influence. The influence was shifting. In fact, it would eventually shift completely away from the Jewish people and it would, they would kind of then separate from it. And it would become a, 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 what, what we know today as Christianity. He was fearful of it. They were losing their customs. People were coming to faith, but they were no longer practicing circumcision. They were no longer adhering to the dietary laws. He was losing credibility with his other Jewish Christians, with, with the leaders of the Jewish Christian church, the Judaizers. They were, they were being critical of him. You're hanging out with Gentiles. Imagine that. You're going to places you probably shouldn't go. Imagine that. You're hanging out with people that shouldn't be hanging out with. Imagine that. You're actually hanging out with people that actually might need the gospel. Huh. And so, we, so, he, so he was fearful. As so often we in the church are fearful. There's a lot of things are changing. Church is starting to look a little bit different. Some of our customs, some of our traditions, we're, we're losing some of them. By the way, it doesn't, mean that we, we, it doesn't mean that every tradition we ever had needs to go. There are things we need to sort of dig our heels in and say, I want to keep this. This is important. I'm not saying that. There can be kind of a, what I would call a creep of secularism that sort of enters into the church where we kind of go, well, I'll disregard that and I'll disregard that and I'll disregard that and keep this one, keep that one. We can't really do that, can we? But I am saying that we shouldn't be afraid when God disrupts things, when God shakes things up, changes things. God is not a God of the past. God is a God of, well, he's a God of the God of past, future, and present. He's a, a present and future. He's God of all time. But God is always kind of working in the now. What's God doing right now? That's what's most important. For us to understand what's going on with Paul's mind, we need to, First of all, we need to recognize that this has ramifications in all kinds of areas of our life. What are our, our blind spots? What are our zipper merge areas? I, I know I've got a bunch of them. I've been reflecting on them a lot. But there's a, there's a lot of things. How does this impact the world of politics? It used to be that there was a political party that if you were a Christian, you aligned with that political party. Now that's not the case. There's Christians on every, in, every, in, in, in both parties and whatever party emerges. Even on controversial in, uh, um, topics like abortion or sexuality, there's Christians on both sides of those issues that have very good, compelling arguments, powerful arguments. The world of uh, economics. What would it mean if the influence of the church shifted? It's changed. It's no longer in the West. The influence of the gospel of Jesus is not in the West anymore. The influence of the gospel, the influence of the church has moved to places we would never really think of. South America, South Africa, South, Southern Asia. Do you know the influence of the church has shifted from wealthy people to poor people? It's poor people that drive the gospel today. It's not rich people. So how does, how does these issues, what are our zipper merge area, these blind spots that we have, impact the area of global economics? It's huge. What about environment, the environment? If I believe that, if, if, I, if I understand that the gospel is not so much about me dying and going to heaven as it is the kingdom, the, the, the kingdom of heaven, the new creation coming to me, what implications does that have in, in the environment? Christians historically have not been very good environmentalists. Maybe we should be. If we believe that God himself is going to restore the heavens and the earth, God's going to do that one day, maybe we should be more active in that and being a part of that restoration as much as we can now because it's part of the hand of God. What we get to do in a little, a little bit, God is going to do in completion. Restoring the, restoring the earth. I'm not going to become a... Tree hugger overnight, by the way. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying maybe as a, as a Christian, as a person of faith, maybe I should care more about planet Earth than I do. My destiny is on planet Earth, not in heaven. Maybe that would have some bearing on that. Because God's going to raise my physical body to reign with Christ forever on planet Earth. I could go on and on and on. 
There's lots of ramifications, lots of blind spots that we have. But if we're going to understand Paul's thinking, we have to understand how he saw the new creation, how he saw people, how he saw hum the human race. We get a pretty good picture of it in 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 15. He says, and he died, that is Jesus died, for all. Imagine a church that believed that Jesus died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Imagine if every person that named the name of Jesus understood that when when I'm given faith, when I'm given new life, I then no longer live for myself. I live for other people. That is a decidedly unwestern thought. In the Western church, we tend to think of, I received Jesus into my heart. I have a personal relationship with Jesus when God tends to think much more about community. We're important, too, as individuals. We're part of that community. But what if we began to think the way Jesus thinks? And that, when, and, and that when we get saved, when we're given new life, it's for the benefit of other people. My, my personal relationship is important, but, my, but, but me giving my life away is even more important. To live my, live my faith in a way that's meaningful for other people. The world's supposed to be a better place because we exist, because we're on it. What if every Christian thought that way? In verse 16, so from now on, we, the apostles, regard no one from a worldly point of view. Huh. What would happen if we viewed no one? Well, certainly Paul can't be talking about those people. What if we saw every human on planet Earth as Jesus sees them? With potential, the target of his grace, the target of his redemption. Now, I know we live in a fallen world, and I know the world is a dark place, and the power of, of Satan is, is, is powerful throughout places of the earth. And I know that. I'm not dismissing that. But what if we were able to see all humans the way God sees them? as opportunities for grace and reconciliation. Not from a worldly perspective, but through the eyes of grace. Though we once re regarded Christ in this way, we do, we, do, no, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Some of our texts say they become a new creation, but the better reading is that the creation has come. In other words, if I become, uh, if, if, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation that is everything being restored, everything that's being restored, everything that we lost in Eden, everything we lost in paradise is now being restored. That's what the new creation is. That's what, that's what culminates with all of human history. The new creation coming. I become a new creation. You become a new creation. The creation, paradise, the kingdom is coming here on earth as it is in heaven. If, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. I can't address every ramification of what, of what, the, of what Peter's big blind spot is and, and how it implicates social and the political realm and the environment and economics and all these things, but I can address one thing. When you come to new life in Christ, you are new. You are part of God's redemptive purpose. Everything changes. And when people come to faith from every different sort of background, even within this congregation right here, we have people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different economics, all kinds of differences, even in this little congregation. And each person brings a little bit of their perspective of who Jesus is, what he's done in their life. We begin to see the gospel from all of these different angles. Can you imagine what now happens when a, when a person from South America, from South Africa, from Southeast Asia, from, from, from uh, Australia, when people begin to... They get saved from all these environments, and now they begin to see the gospel from all these different perspectives, but they have different ideas, different cultures, different customs. It, man, it just blows the roof off of the way we perceive the gospel of Christ. When we see it that way, we're no longer so concerned about our own culture, our own customs. We're saying it's a, because God's not concerned about them. God doesn't care. 
God's not concerned for our culture and how we may or may not be losing it. He doesn't have some sort of image of the golden age of the church, and I just wish the church would get it. That's nowhere on God's radar. God says, look at what I'm doing now. I don't care about all this other stuff. When, everybody become, when, when people become new creations in Jesus Christ, it, it changes everything. When we begin to think of our faith, our, 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 our lives of faith, less about a decision I made for Jesus and more about Jesus instilling new life in me, a dead thing being, coming, being made to life, that's powerful. And raising a community, a bold community of faith to transform planet Earth. That's powerful. When Jesus penetrates a culture, you guys, this has always been the case. Always. Throughout the history of the church. When Jesus penetrates a culture, he tips it upside down. When Jesus sets people free, now all of a sudden the slave and the free man, the prisoner and the, and the, and the free citizen are worshiping together. Tips it all upside down. People from all different sort of religious backgrounds. Hindu, Muslim, Jewish. People get saved. They begin to now worship Jesus in ways that are meaningful to them from their culture, from their perspectives. Things that may be important to us, they, have no, they might not even have any interest in. And yet things, their customs may seem strange to us. And yet it's the gospel of the kingdom. It's very powerful. It's also very messy. What would happen if people that we're not supposed to be hanging around with suddenly got saved? Are they going to start acting like us all of a sudden? No, that doesn't happen. Think of that kind of church. See, I have no interest in being the pastor of a, of a safe, sanitary, systematized church. I have no interest in orders of worship. God has no interest in our orders of worship. Certainly on the day of Pentecost, they weren't going, oh, my stars, God has gotten out of the order of service. Whatever shall we do? Clutch my pearls. <laughs> when God does things, it's powerful. That's the church of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus barging into the table and into the temple and pull, kicking over the tables and saying, this is a bunch of bull crap. You're not going to do this in my church. My people are going to, my house is going to be a place of prayer. That's the power. I, want, I don't want this idea of church where we come in and we're comfortable and the room is set just right and the chairs are perfect and the bathrooms are clean. All oh, those are good things, by the way. Nothing wrong with those things. But I want the raw, naked power of God, the way people are experiencing it all over the world, but somehow it eludes us. That's what I want. That's the kind of church I want to be a pastor of. When Jesus Christ penetrates culture, every idea, every concept, everything that's important to us, he just completely just tips over the whole apple cart and it all just spills out. Some of y'all are about ready to have a heart attack. You're like, oh my God, he's got to pick up those balls. People might start playing with them. I've got to pick. Church might actually become a fun place where people start bouncing balls around. But I've got to pick these back up. We've got to put them back in order. We got to put... Otherwise, things are going to get out of order. It's just going to get too much. God says, I don't really have any interest in that. I'm just going to keep tipping it out. I'm going to t keep tipping them out until you understand it's not your church. It's mine. And I will do with it what I want to do with it. It's my church, not yours. And I want to do some powerful things in it. And I, God says, I will not be marginalized by you. I will not fit into your systems. I don't worship a God that fits in my systems. I don't worship a God that can be sanitized by me, made powerless. I don't worship a God who's safe. My God is safe, or my God is strong and powerful, and one word can destroy a nation. That's my God. And until we get that, we will never see the power. You know who we'll be until we get that? 
will be people who run around saying, everybody zipper merge, everybody zipper merge, but we're still the crabby people sitting in the back, stuck in the traffic, glowering at everybody that's r- r- running by us. I don't, want, I don't want free Christians zipping by me. I want to be the one zipping by everybody else, cutting into the front of the line. Because that's the gospel. That's what the church is supposed to be. I want my apple cart completely turned over. And I'm not going to do what Peter did. Peter saw that the apple cart was turned over, and he was the guy that actually was instrumental in turning it over, but he's the one picking up all the apples and trying to put them all back in. And and Paul says, you can't do that. God's way smarter than you. Let God figure out how how they're going to go back, how they're going to be arranged. That's not your job. He rebuked him. He says, you're wrong. We can't rebuild the systems in our own image. So much of what we do in the church is us rebuilding the church the way we want it to be. And Jesus says, it's my church. I'll build it. You're not building my church. I want God to completely turn over my apple cart. I want what's new. I want the power. And and by the way, what's new is very, very old. This is, not new, this is not a new discussion of the church. This is historical Christianity, by the way. Maybe some of y'all have never heard it, but it's not new. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds, 2,000 years it's been around. I'm not preaching a new gospel. I want the, I want the power of God now. I don't want to live my life hoping to die and go to heaven. I want to live my life seeing heaven, the new creation, coming on earth as Jesus promised it would. I want my apple cart turned over. I don't want anything keeping me from it. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. These are some folks that I I think are pretty committed to having their apple carts turned over. You guys want your apple carts turned over? Yeah? You want them turned over? Worship team? I I think worship team is going to take us to some new places that we haven't been before because they're going to have their apple cart turned over. They're ready for it. How about the how about you AV techs? Ah, uh, you can stay back there. I won't make you come up. But how about you AV techs? You guys ready to have your apple carts turned over? Are you kind of ready for some new things, a new season, a new power, a new depth? Are you tired of safe, sanitized, systematized church? Ready for something new? Yeah. What about all of our ushers and greeters? Why don't you guys stand up? If you've ever ushered or greeted, done anything like that, served in our cafe, why don't you come forward? I know what you're saying already, but I serve as an usher and a greeter because I don't want to come forward. No, come on forward, you guys. Come on up. You guys ready to have your apple carts turned over? You ready to get rid of the things that are keeping the power of God from coming in fullness here at Cross Point Church? Ready to think of some new paradigms, new ideas? You ready? You guys ready? Can't cry. Oscar, where's your swagger? Man, you were swaggering a little bit ago. I ain't seeing no swagger now. Are you ready, Oscar? You ready? Ready to get this cart turned over? What about some of our Sunday school teachers? Anybody ever taught, anybody ever taught Sunday school with our kids? Why don't you guys come on up? If you've been involved in our Sunday school, our children's program, wiped a few baby butts, if you've ever done any of that, come on up. You guys might have to spread around a little bit. You guys ready? All you teachers, you guys ready to have the apple cart turned over? Do something new, something powerful? You know, our kids, our kids need to know I have every intention. I don't know when I'm going to retire. It's not going to be for a long, long time because I'm pretty sure I'm going to live to 100. But I, I have every intention of handing a weird church off. God does weird stuff. When the power of God hits, it's weird. I don't want our kids doing church the same way we do church. Some of the things I admire so much about some of you older folks, and I'm getting to that place myself, is you involve yourself. You, I know the worship is a stretch for you. I know sometimes things seem kind of strange, but you're right there because you understand the, you understand that it's, the church is not about us. It's about handing off something powerful, bold, fierce, weird. That's the church of Jesus Christ. What about some of you teleos leaders? We got any teleos leaders out there? I want you guys to come on up. Some of you teleos leaders have already seen what weird is. It's powerful, isn't it? 
When God sets the captives free, there's no other word to describe it. It's powerful. It was beyond. I don't worship a God that I can systematize. I don't. God is beyond my systems. I don't worship a God that I can sanitize. I don't worship a God that I can sort of fit into my paradigms. He's beyond that. What about musicians? Have we got any musicians out there that have played up here? I don't know. I can't really see right now. But anybody that's played out there, any other musicians, sung in the choir, any choir members out there? Why don't you stand up and come on up here, too, if you've sung in our choir? What about some of our board members? We got board members out there, elders. They're more the first service type. You guys all ready to have some apple tart carts turned over? Yeah. I'm ready for it. Church, this is, these, these are your leaders. These are your servants. I don't want to miss anybody out. If you've served in the church in any capacity, if you've done something, you've helped, if, I, if I missed you, just come on up as God moves your heart. I don't, sometimes when you do lists like these, you forget Miles, people. I don't want to. Amanda and Miles, yes. Amanda We're talking and Miles. About it. Oh, on. that was the one. Man, my heart is growing more and more and more towards the people that clean this church. Man, that's a powerful thing. Do you know that do you, I come down here on Saturday? I come here on Saturday, and I, I kind of do my final preparations. I study. I pray. I'm kind of back there quiet as a mouse, and pretty soon I'll hear a vacuum cleaner flip on. And I, I hear some people banging around stairs, and they're cleaning the church, and I love it. If you've cleaned the church, if you've, if you've mowed a lawn, if you've, if, you've, if you've set up for a room, I want you up here. These are our leaders. These are our servants. I could go on and on because some of us give, some of us pray. We all serve in a way, but the, these are people that... Make this happen. Are you all ready to have your apple carts turned over? I'm ready. I, I, don't want, I don't want anything in my cart. I want to let God put it all together. When the captive gets set free, when dead people are made alive, that is beyond our capacity to organize and structure. That's the power of the living God. And if God can do that, there's nothing that is impossible. Crosspoint Church has just, we've just barely scratched the surface of our potential. We've just barely scratched it. Because with God, nothing is impossible.